Up till now in our panel discussion on ethnicity and conflict, we've talked about the innate psychological roots of ethnic conflict, the possible impact of economics, and the whole question of whether multicultural programs actually work in stemming ethnic conflict. In this last segment, we asked our panelists to talk about some of the possible solutions that might arise out of human conflict research. So you ask a psychologist, and as such, I will give you a, a, something that could be ratcheted up to be a policy based on what I know to be a signature result from, from my own discipline and my own work. Um, and, and that is, the signature result is that there is a dissociation or a disparity between what we consciously avow, our values, our intentions, and so on, and then what we implicitly or less consciously reveal, okay? How we speak towards people, how we lead our lives every day. There is a large disparity. Our values are highfalutin, our behaviors are lowly. And that disparity, I think if that is made known to people, if individual people who can come face to face with this disparity can then be left to devise for themselves a personal policy. Okay, so this is, I'm not talking about the intervention of governments. I'm now just saying, put the data in the hands of the people, show them that their own lives are being led in such a way that their behavior is not consistent with their own values, not that of a god, not that of their president, not that of their parents, but themselves. And once you do that and do it convincingly, I have great hope that people will change their behavior so that it's more in line with their values. So that's a, an individual approach, Mazarin, that, that you're suggesting. Richard, do you have any other policy approaches that you might suggest? And then, Debraj, I'm going to ask you the, next, the, the same thing. Absolutely. And, and I mean, my, my view would echo uh, Mazarin's. Um, but it's, it's about not just telling people to embrace diversity because it's the right thing to do, but telling them to embrace diversity because it's good for them to do that. Um, and you know, there is research now which is showing that people who do have you know, multicultural experiences or who live in uh, diverse environments um, show benefits for other aspects of their cognitive functioning. Um, so they become better at creativity, at problem solving, cognitive, various broader dimensions of, of cognitive flexibility. And so showing people this evidence, showing people that you know, actually diversity is good, not just because you know, it's you know, morally right and the right thing to do, but also because it's good for you. Uh, as an individual, um, is is the way to achieve social change in this area. Debrash, did you have anything you wanted to add on this? Uh, We've been talking about individuals, but I'm wondering if you have sort of a, a broader view or some suggestions yeah. for actual policy. Yeah, well, quick caveat though, because I think that the stuff that you guys are talking about is really fascinating, and I and, and I would love, like to learn much more about that. Now, when I'm going to talk about the economics of, 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 of the policy, that doesn't mean that I think economic motivations are fundamental in all of this, but I'm just going to provide that as a separate perspective. Okay, so, so, you know, in the case of conflict, one of the most important things about real conflict that we see in developing countries, I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm not trivializing a lot of what we're talking about, which are differences in attitudes, and, but, but, you know, these are at best debates and shouting at each other over a picket line. We're talking about people killing each other, right? In situations like that, people actually have to put their lives on the line, right? So now, when you think about what putting your lives on the line entails, it means that the alternative for young men who are actually going there and committing acts of violence is a life generally of poverty, unemployment, uh, their, their other options are very limited. So I think to me, it seems that the first and most fundamental policy implication in, in, in thinking about uh, reducing violence as we see it in developing countries is rapid economic growth. Okay? Now, having said that, we just talked about examples in which economic growth can actually give rise to more violence, right? We talked about the example of uh, Muslim incomes going up and that actually inciting more violence. So it's not a very simple, it's not entirely simple how, uh, uh, how one is actually uh, to think about economic growth as, as, as a violence reducer. But there's no doubt in my mind that sustained economic development has to bring conflict down, simply because for people like you and me, it's way too expensive to give up our job and try and go out there to kill some people. <laughs> uh, that's very, okay, so that's, that, that would be my first uh, policy implication, which is that focus on the economics of development of growth. 
The second one would be information. So let me give you an example. If you, again, I go back to India, which is where I come from. If you look at affirmative, if you think affirmative action in the United States is, 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 is quite strong, you should go to India. Okay? India has all sorts of affirmative action. There's so much affirmative action in India that the, that the total of the reserve pie adds up to, to more than the sum of its... Hang on, sorry. Um, <laughs> So, in the, uh, so these guys, um, um, so, so, so what happens is, why is there affirmative action which is based on caste lines? Or, or, or now in India even there's a call for religious lines. Why is so much affirmative action based on these things? The reason is that it's impossible to get economic information about how much a person earns. Okay? So the Indian government would love to help the poor. Okay, let's assume it would love to help the poor. It can't help the poor because we can't identify who the poor are. Uh, the way to do it is to get uh, uh, something that's broadly correlated, like people who are low caste, or, the, or actually scheduled caste, what are called scheduled caste in India, and then try to use policies that are based on caste rather than based on economic information, because we don't have that information. But whenever a government pursues policies that are based on things like caste, it's absolutely fertile ground for then creating salience along those lines. Okay, so it propagates salience. So my second point would be that we need to build information. By we, I mean governments need to use economic characteristics in order to make distributions of resources across different groups and not use non-economic characteristics. It's not that the government is doing it purposely, it's just that it has no other way to actually carry out these redistributions. You're saying that salient means people paying more attention to these caste differences, and that can be bad because that can exacerbate a group bias. That's exactly right. That's what I meant. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Thank right. you. I, right. And the, and, the last, and the last policy point that I would make is what I call contestability, which has to do with, you know, if you look at different political groups, the more contestability there is in the political arena, I mean, I, I use the word contestability rather than democracy, because democracy is a special case of contestability. What I mean more generally is that each political group in a country has somebody else waiting in the wings ready to grab power. Okay, so just the opposite of a dictatorship and democracy would be a special case of that. Once we have lots of contestability, then no group can be ignored or no group can be attacked without serious worry about your own survival as a political. So we see that in any situation where there's a lot of political contestability, minority groups are typically protected. Minority groups are protected not because of the benevolence of the government, but because of the government's need to survive. So I would just summarize economic growth, information, contestability. So uh, kind of a mixture of uh, what we're hearing of large-scale policy initiatives and, uh, and some very individual, uh, individually focused uh, things. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. I wanted to just give everybody an opportunity for one last uh, one last comment, if you if you're of interest, or if you're if you're interested in uh, in giving one, uh, Mazarin. Um, I think that Professor Ray will agree with me um, when I say that I too come from India. Uh, it's interesting to me that on this panel you have two Indians and a Brit. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, and I, and I explain it. Yeah, very nicely diverse, I think. <laughs> I, I, I actually uh, wanted to um, just say that you know when you look at what where India is today, there is I think absolutely no way it could be where it is if the government had not had the kind of uniquely affirmative uh, policies that it has had for the last fifty uh, odd years. The school that I went to, the college that I went to, it may have been an unusual one, but to admit students, it took into account test scores and you know letters of recommendation and essays and exams, and then to that it added a set of dimensions. Did your family live in a part of the country that had famines in the last X number of years, had droughts in the last X number of years? How much money did your grandparents make, your parents make? I mean, this was this is the kind of information that he's talking about. This was all gathered, put into a pool, and then your admission was determined by how you came out, looking at everything, your own performance on the standardized 
kinds of tests and essays, but also these very deep economic um, challenges that some people may have faced over others. And, and I think in the US, uh, people would be absolutely stunned to think that anybody could ever use a set of these variables in making decisions about who should go to college. But just think about what that country has achieved. And, 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 and I think that, that when you ask what policy, I think we should look at the countries that have done things that may seem radical mm -hmm. and just look at the difference between where they were in 1947 and now. And I think it tells you what the right things are that we could be doing. Dave Raj? Sure. No, I, uh, I, I won't say much. Just to follow up on what, what, uh, what Mazarin just said, because I think it's very important. Uh, uh, the, the things that have been achieved because of serious affirmative action are incredible. But at the same time, these things also raise salience and awareness along lines that that we would not like to we would not like to raise uh, say uh, you know awareness about. So, do, how, how do we how do we how do we manage to reconcile these two points of view? And that's what I meant by information. The way we reconcile is that we get direct information about what people learn or what their parents have learned, so that we can use that information just somebody's economic deprivation alone to carry out our affirmative action. And it's only when we do that, that a lot of these semi-artificially created caste boundaries and religious boundaries are going to fade away. That's yeah, and I, yeah, and I just want to add that I actually think that that's the way to persuade people uh, about it. I think we will not be persuaded, and why should we be persuaded when we are told that a group of people that were discriminated against in the past are the ones that now should have priority. Uh, well, I didn't do that. I didn't do Precise. that. I didn't do that thing you know, 300 years ago or 200 years ago. Why should I pay a price today for that? But I think many more people will come along if they know that we're not looking at racial lines for, for, for affirmative action, but rather we're looking at economic lines uh, for affirmative action. I think it's a much more persuasive argument and we'll, we'll get traction if we use that rather than um, the ethnic and, and, and racial lines that we tend to bring up of course, those will come along with, with the economic ones, but I do think that the economic ones are a very positive way to frame the manner in which we want to go about equalizing the society. And Richard Crisp, any, any follow-up on this? Um, well, I guess what's been uh, fascinating about this discussion is it's illustrating um, what I think we'd all, we'd, we'd all agree, which is that the causes of conflict are, are multifaceted. So they involve economic, political, social, and psychological dimensions. Um, and I guess the, the, the take home message for me would, would be that the solutions also require social, economic, political, and many other uh, dimensions to, 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 address, um, to address human conflict.